Do you need companion AI to follow your player? Maybe have them attack nearby objects? In this video, we're going to look at how to implement a companion AI that follows our player, rotates around them, and attacks nearby objects. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. A companion is something that a lot of game types really like to have to help you out whenever the player is going through some kind of ordeal. Sometimes they simply follow the player around, sometimes they'll actually do something and attack. There's that one fairy character in League of Legends that has a little attacky companion. We're going to make something similar to that today. One of the most simple ways to do this is simply to parent the companion underneath the player and just have them kind of follow them around, rotate around them, something like that. But really that doesn't end up looking very good in your game. So what we're going to do is have a companion that will follow the player based on wherever the player is going. So it's going to be a discrete nav mesh agent that is separate from the player that will set their destination based on the player's destination. This gives the most organic feel whenever the player's moving, the companion will also follow them wherever they're going. The companion's also going to have their own state. That way we have a player state and a companion state and the companion state will be driven by what the player is doing. But we want to make sure that that companion finishes whatever they're doing. For example, if we move a player somewhere and the companion's trailing behind a little bit, as soon as the player stops, we don't immediately want the companion to go into the idle state. We want them to finish going to their place and then go into the idle state. The companion in our video will be able to attack, but it's not going to be a discrete state. It's going to be just controlled whenever something's nearby. It's going to start attacking, but it's going to continue doing the movement that it was doing before. So if it's idle and rotating around the player, it'll just start attacking stuff nearby. If it's moving and something comes nearby, then again, it will start attacking that until it comes out of range. We don't want the attack to interrupt the movement in this case. I've chosen a relatively simplistic way of managing the state between these two, and I can see that over a long period of time, this can become a really complex area of your code. So you may consider implementing something more robust like a behavior tree for your companion. If this is the extent of what you need your companion to do, then this way is probably fine. Before we go any further, I want to give a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Every one of you is helping this channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people, and that means more people are making their game dev dreams become a reality. If you want to help support that mission, you can go to patreon.com slash academy, choose whichever tier you're most comfortable with. You'll start getting some cool perks like getting your name up here in the section and getting a voice shout out starting at the awesome tier. Speaking of those awesome supporters, I have Andrew Bowen, Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Paul Berry, and Matt Parkin. I am so grateful for your support. Thank you. Let's get started with seeing how is the scene set up. We have a player that's this green cylinder, our companion, which is this yellow ball, and then some attack dummy posts that are on this nav mesh. If we take a look at the nav mesh, we'll see that the posts are baked into the nav mesh, so our player and companion should both avoid them. Both the player and the companion are nav mesh agents with different types. We have a player and a companion type. One really important configuration on the nav mesh agent of the player is that it has a lower priority than the nav mesh agent of the companion. We have 49 for the player and 50 for the companion. This makes the companion avoid the player and the player totally disregard the companion when we're doing pathing. The player has pretty simple click to move as well as a player script that has a state and will raise state change events whenever the player goes from moving to idle. This is important because we need our companion to mirror our player's state because whenever the player is moving, we're going to want the companion to just follow the player. We don't want them to be circling around them or something like that. In the idle state, we'll have them behave a little bit differently. But first, the companion needs to get to the point around the player that they're trying to get to. So there's a little bit of a delay between the player's state change and the companion state change, potentially. That's actually where quite a bit of the complexity of this comes from, is making sure our companion is properly responding to the player's state. Two more really important configurations here is one, the companion has an attack radius as a child. That's just a spear collider trigger that's on the layer companion attack radius. All of the poles that we're going to be able to attack are on the attackable layer and the companion attack radius only collides with attackables. When we start talking about the companion attack radius, we'll get into why is this set up this way. So let's start taking a look at the scripts to see how does that work. If I open up the player class, you'll see that it does not extend a mono behavior. It actually extends an abstract state behavior of type player state. We'll hop over to that in just a second. Let's just note that on start, what we're doing is calling change state, which is defined on the abstract state behavior. 
and we're gonna say that we're gonna go to the idle state. You'll remember that in the inspector, the player started at the initial state, and we wanna actually trigger a state change whenever we start the game to have the player go into the idle state. On the abstract state behavior, it extends a mono behavior where the state type is an enum. What this allows us to do is define a public state type that has a public git and a protected set this is important because we don't want any class to update the state. We want them to request a state change via the change state function here. That's important because we're going to raise an event, our state change event, that passes in the old state and the new state. So whenever we're getting a state change, we can properly respond to that state change. The companion movement class is specifically really interested in these state change events, but this allows us to raise these events. So any class that needs to know whenever the player state has changed, they can subscribe to this by just doing on state change plus equal and then handle state change in that class. Since we're talking about the companion as well, let's go ahead and open up the companion class. This is another abstract state behavior that has the companion state. On start, we're gonna make our companion start idling as well. And that's really the only thing that happens here. Before we get into the really interesting part about the companion movement, let's quickly take a look at our simple click to move on the player movement. I've done this countless times in the AI series so far, so I'm not gonna go into it in too much detail. We're simply allowing us to left click to move, choosing a point on the nav mesh if we hit something and setting the agent destination to be there. The change that we're doing a little bit differently here is we have a reference to that player, which remember is the abstract state behavior with a player state type. So whenever we set the destination, what I'm going to do is player.change state to player state dot moving. I've also added in a condition to check that if we have stopped moving, then we will go back to the idle state. And we're just checking if we've stopped moving by comparing the remaining distance to the stopping distance. And of course that the player state is moving because we don't want to constantly be changing state back to idle and raising these events if we are already in the idle state. So we're just making sure we are moving and these other things have happened, then we'll just one time call the change state back to idle. Now for the companion, we have a reference to the player because remember we need to subscribe to those player events. And we have a reference to our companion because we need to be able to check what state are we currently in, update that state, and respond appropriately to the player state based on our current state. I have a couple of configurations here, one about how fast we should rotate around the player when they're idle, and one about how far away from the player should we pick a point whenever that player is moving, because we don't want the companion to be right up on the player. There should be a little bit of distance between them. And finally, two coroutines, the movement coroutine, which will handle the movement, and a state change coroutine, which maybe seems a little bit weird, and we'll talk about why we use that in just a little bit. On awake, we'll get a reference to the nav mesh agent and assign the handle state change handler to the player dot on state change. And what does that look like? In here, we check if the state change coroutine is not null. If it's not, we stop it. Then we have a switch on the new state. We don't really care about the old state in this implementation. When the player state has just changed to idle, we're going to start the state change coroutine called handle idle player. And again, once we look at that implementation, it'll make a little bit more sense. Why is this a coroutine versus like what we're doing below on the moving where we just call handle moving player. Let's look at the moving player first. Whenever a player is moving, we're going to immediately change the companion state to follow. They're gonna stop whatever they're doing and start trying to set a destination. We'll check if the movement coroutine is not null. If it's not, we'll stop it. And if the agent is not enabled, we're gonna go ahead and enable that agent and then warp them. A little sneak peek into the future is whenever we're rotating around the player, we're not using the nav mesh agent. We're simply translating the companion position around the player. It's a lot cheaper of a way to handle it than having the nav mesh agent actually try to path around the player constantly. So after we've re-enabled the agent and made sure that the nav mesh system understands that this agent has moved to some new position, then we'll start a coroutine to follow the player. In the follow player, the very first thing we do is yield return null. When we set an agent destination, it's not always set in that exact frame. So if we wait for the next frame before we start doing something, we will know that that destination has been properly set. We'll then get a reference to the player's nav mesh agent because we need to know what their destination is. We're going to calculate a position around that player. So what I'm gonna do is assign a position offset to be the follow radius times a new vector three, passing in mathf.cosine two times pi, times a random value. So I pick really a random location on the unit circle for the X, zero for the Y because we want to be still on the nav mesh and another random point on the unit circle, mathf.sign two times mathf.pi times a random value. So that's again, just a random point around the player on the unit circle, We're multiplying that out by the follow radius. So that way we'll take that one unit around the player and go out however many units the follow radius is, and then set the agent destination to the player destination plus this position offset. We'll then wait a frame. 
because again, we wanna wait for the agent destination to be fully set. And then we will wait until the agent remaining distance is less than or equal to the stopping distance. So we've come close enough to the point that we can count it as stopped. And then we're gonna go ahead and change the companion state to idle because we've reached that destination. We wanna start rotating around the player. If we just quickly look at rotate around player, all we're doing is have a wait for fixed update wait equals new wait for fixed update. While true, we're gonna rotate around the player with transform.rotate around, player.transform.position, with vector three up being the axis, going at the rotation speed. Then we yield return the weight. I'm using fixed update instead of updating every frame because the update every frame was actually a little bit jittery, but the way for fixed update was a lot smoother. If this is jittery for you, you can just yield return null instead of yield return weight, and maybe that works a little bit better. Now that we've looked at the movement, let's look at how do we handle going to idle. We're gonna do a switch on the companion state, and if the companion state is currently follow, we're going to wait two frames. Once we've waited those two frames, then we will wait until the companion state has changed to idle. Once it's changed to idle, then we'll go to the case of companion state idle, where we're just checking the movement coroutine is not null. We stop it and then we disable an app mesh agent and start the moving coroutine to make the companion rotate around the player. What you saw in the follow player was we had to wait one frame because the player's destination isn't immediately set. It usually takes a frame for that to happen. So we have to wait one frame before we start moving the agent. Then we have to wait another frame for the companion's agent to start moving. And then we're waiting until the remaining distance is less than or equal to the stopping distance. So if we don't wait for these two frames here, if the player goes idle and then moves at just the right time, the companion ends up being out of sync and we end up with some weird cases on these coroutines. So that's why we have to wait for the two frames, wait, make sure that our agents both have a destination, they're both moving somewhere, and then we wait for the state change back to idle. That's why this state change has to be a coroutine because we need to wait some frames and then wait for something else to happen and then start handling the idle state. Let's take a quick look at how does the companion attack? What I'm not doing is making there be a state change to like an attacking state because I actually want the companion to still be doing whatever it was they were doing and just attack the object nearby. This may not be the behavior you want in your game, but that's the behavior I chose for this one. You could do something very similar to this if you wanted them to actually change states. You would just need to change the companion state to something like attacking and also make them move some kind of way whenever we enter in that attack state. In here, I just have some variables here up at the top that are going to control how does the bullets move, how fast does the companion attack and that kind of stuff. We're also keeping a list of attackable objects because I want this companion to attack the closest person all the time. To do that on trigger enter, which is going to be anytime that a collider enters this trigger that I have, we'll try to get the component attackable, which doesn't actually do anything in this case, but it was just a script that I would have there. Normally you'd have it so an attackable object can like take damage, it'd have life, something like that. We're just gonna add that to the list of currently available objects. We'll check if the attacker routine is not null. If it's not, we'll stop it and start it again. We'll do essentially the inverse on exit, where whenever some collider enters, we'll check, does it have attackable? If it does, then we'll remove that from our list of attackable objects, and we'll stop the attack coroutine if there are no more objects here. I'm not checking if it's not null because it's guaranteed to be assigned to something by the time we get here. You might think it's a little bit weird that I'm stopping the attack coroutine whenever we're gonna start a new attack, but I make it wait at the beginning and then find the closest attackable and then just spawn some bullet and make that go towards the target. So we're gonna make sure that we always wait at least the attack delay before we start attacking. That's why I'm stopping this coroutine in the middle and then starting it over whenever we're getting new objects in here. To find the closest attackable, all we do is set the closest distance to be a really big value, iterate over all the attackable objects, check the distance of all of them. If the distance is now less than the closest distance, we'll set that to be the new closest distance and set the closest index to be i. We'll go over all of these attackable objects and then just return the closest one based on that closest index. After we spawn this thing, we're just gonna make it move from the start position to the end position, moving at a fixed speed. At the end, then we'll set this game object to be false and we'd be done. If we hop back to the Unity editor to check out how this plays, you'll see how this companion AI is attacking these attack dummies as it rotates in a circle around me and will attack the closest one as it rotates between the two. As I start moving, the companion starts following me, still attacking the closest object. Once it reaches the point wherever it got to to follow me at its follow distance, it'll start spinning around me again, attacking the closest attack dummies. We'll notice that it can get very close to the player, never go inside the player, and then once the player stops, it'll go back to the normal distance apart and then start spinning in a circle again. This of course is a very simple companion AI. All they're doing is following the player, 
and may be rotating around them whenever they're idle. If you start getting into a more complex companion where you want to have the player be able to issue them orders and that kind of stuff, they end up acting more like a player and you want them to not really follow exactly this kind of a pattern. They'll need a more complex state machine or behavior tree, something like that, to really manage that kind of interaction between all the different stuff that they can do. But regardless of the system that you're using, I would recommend having them as a discrete nav mesh agent if you're using a nav mesh in your game, because it gives them a lot more of organic feel about how they move around the world versus just having them parented and following along with the player that way. If you got value out of this video, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. Remember, this new video is posted every tutorial Tuesday, and I'll see you next week.